Well, I'm adopting the role of reviewer, which means that I'm sort of reminding people of what was in the energy chapter of radical technology when we then will pro progress to the, the, the commentators who will give their opinions on what was and wasn't good in that chapter. So let me quickly run through. Um, it begins with an introduction by somebody called Godfrey Boyle, who will be known to some of you. Um, it was based, in fact, on a book that I had just written called Living on the Sun, published by Caldwell Boyers in a series called Ideas in Progress, which was meant to be a series that represented sort of, dare I say, half-baked ideas <laughs> on the subject of interest to them. So anyway, I did a quick introduction to the first and second laws of thermodynamics and basically made the preliminary case that the energy impinging on the Earth from the sun is so huge that it, is, it can be the basis of running our entire civilization. That was the gist of my introductory chapter. Um, and there was a diagram showing how this might be done. Then we had articles from Robert and Brenda Vale um, on what one was called plant. Oh, was that? Yes, that was theirs, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, Robert Vale and Brenda Vale. Um, they, in fact, haven't, unfortunately, they, they send their very best wishes. And they would love to be here. In fact, they're going to be in the UK in a few weeks' time, but they couldn't make two journeys. However, if you look in the big exhibition room at one of the video screens, they sent an excellent PowerPoint presentation, which is rotating one slide every five seconds, which will give you their most recent ideas on the subject of plant solar energy, um, insulation, the lot. The, the, the veils are, you know, still, they're, they're professors in New Zealand these days, and they're quite a long way away, so you could forgive them for not being here. And so, uh, another chapter, sorry, did someone say? Okay. Another chapter which was written by uh, Robert Vail on, on, called Sunshine Superpower, which was mainly about the heating aspects of solar energy. Um, and a very comprehensive look at um, passive solar housing, although we'll be having Sue Roof talking about that in a minute, um, so, so I won't dwell on that and any other things. But one great lacuna, which I certainly have spotted and I would be happy to draw to your attention, is that the chapter has nothing, or almost nothing, on photovoltaics, which is solar electricity which to my astonishment, and I, I've now written an awful lot about it, and it's now one of the leading renewable energy sources. We had practically nothing to say about it 40 years ago. There was a tiny reference to, you can see the odd solar cell depicted here and there. Uh, so that's a huge lacuna in the, um, the book, which I happily admit. Now, we had an, an excellent chapter on wind energy by the Honourable Derek Taylor, who I'm pleased to say is with us, a very long and detailed chapter on wind energy, which again, in those days, I don't think any of us, even Derek, realised the potential that would be realised, you probably double me, um, by wind power in the, the last decade or two. It's just taken off in a way that maybe Derek in business, but possibly even he didn't quite think it would take off the way it has. But thanks to say, I told you so. Anyway, um, then the next chapter is on hydropower, called essentially cooperative energy, which was by George Wilston. He's unfortunately not able to be here. But we are, I mean, we know that hydropower, in fact, there are some new hydropower projects in the UK. They're all quite small, but not to be d d confused, of course, with wave power and tidal power, which are somewhat different in their origin, uh, uh, with tidal power being lunar in its, in, its, in its origin. But there hasn't, we've got nothing on wave and tidal power in here at all, which is another lacuna in, in the book. And the coverage of, of chapter of, of hydro is, I think, a little bit um, limited as well. So there's a lot more to be said about hydropower. Then at the end of the, the chapter, or almost the end, is a chapter called Cast Iron Power by a very, well, he, someone who was then very famous, some of you you'll remember, Kit Pedler, who used to do lots of BBC TV programmes. We, some of us visited his, his house, was it was um, and he had this engine in his basement that he used to generate both electricity and heat for his house, and his, his was a sort of micro-scale, household-scale CHP, so that, unfortunately, Kit isn't able to be here to... Um, to talk about that now. So finally, I did an interview with some of you from the Netherlands will remember Seats Leiflein, who was running the Decliner Erde, and there's an interview with him in the book by me, interviewed by me. 
And again, I can't, I, I, we can't. Uh, I, it, it seems he's no longer with us, is not he? Or is he still? He is, yes. He is still alive. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, so he, he told me that today. I'm sorry, I made that mistake already today once. Thank you, Father. I mustn't, <laughs> mustn't write people off prematurely, must I? Okay, right, so. Okay, fine. I think that's enough of an introduction for me. And, and uh, can I now hand over to Sue, who I think once would like to be next? And we're. Uh, yes, please do, Sue. Is that enough for me? I think it probably is. Okay, hi. I just want to use this opportunity to show how incredibly important the radical technology movement was. Do not think that we would be where we are now without <coughs> them, because they laid those foundations on which we could build. And um, it's really, I don't think we've picked this up enough during this um, session to say actually you, many of you, are profoundly important in how much we've been able to achieve to date. I just want to deal with one aspect, which was the solar dream. <laughs> and it was such a powerful dream, wasn't it? It was, um, if we look at it, future world choices. We were there making a choice. We wanted to build a better world. We wanted to build it from nature's bounty. We wanted to uh, remove without destroying the earth and to do it on clean, free solar energy. And you can see, you know, the 250 square miles, that's all we need to run the energy we need for the earth per day. This is slightly gone off the screen, so I'm sorry about that. But just to say that when I got to building that first integrated solar roof in Britain there on the Oxford Eco House, who did I have to turn to to build it? The hippies. It was the cat were the only people who really could build it because they had been gradually building up that expertise and um, sharing the idea that this was a credible future. So I could go then to Cat and say, come in now, we're going to build the first one. But I couldn't do it by myself because you see all of those people, we all stand on the shoulders. So here we have the Eats team standing on Brinkman's shoulders, you know? Uh, we've got Bruce Cross, we've got some of the BP boys, we've got uh, Alan Dickler, people who are trained by people who are in the early radical technology movement and started to form and shape it. So as an educator too, Godfrey, I mean, you and the team have got a huge amount we've got to be grateful for. So it was a shared dream, and I'm sorry you can't see my beautiful little electric car there, Hannibal. <laughs> Some of you may have seen Hannibal before, but that was driving around in a solar electric car in 1992. This we built, um, and we had to change the planning, uh, we had to change the building regulations, fire, structural weight, we had to change the first grid connection um, contract, we had to um, I mean, all the design, you can see all the different design systems we had to put in to get the first one built, you know. We had to design everything and get all the laws changed. It was a monumental achievement. And this was the dream. Load shifting, load shaving. We would try through behaviours and technology to run our life increasingly on that free, clean technology. So the radical technology, <coughs> if I'm right in characterising it, it as technologically focused mm -hmm. yeah, more like with behaviours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know what the problem with that is? Is that what has been forgotten, I maintain, is the buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, the mantra, half the demand, double the efficiency mm -hmm. of the machines, mm -hmm. you know, create as much as you can from clean energy, etc. Actually, it's the building skills that we have lost too, I think. And um, here we can see, I, w I want you to, to, to really think about this. The idea of the most fundamentally important bit of that zero carbon equation is getting the building right. <laughs> and um, in order to do that, people have forgotten, because everything is now crunched in a... Um, in a computational box, you know, that dominates how you think about a building design. But 
actually, fundamentally, all the things you can't change about a building is what matters. The orientations, the size of the openings, the mass it contains, um, creates what I call the building character. It's the personality of the building. So every building <coughs> has a heartbeat. So if you have like a well-behaved building, and I'll cite that Oxford Eco House as a really, it's almost flat heartbeat. The trouble is with, for instance, the passive house idea was it leads to lightweight, no mass often, um, very overglazed on certain aspects. So you're getting a much less well-behaved one. And a lot of architects are still designing the glass boxes which are really, I mean, psychotic buildings. <laughs> and how do you get that basic building? You face it in the right direction. You use orientation to use energy when you need it. You um, put your airlocks in, you, you put your overcoats and your raincoats on. And you get the orientation right so you can use the extra winter gain and avoid that summer overheating because you will not believe one of the biggest growing problems we have in Scotland is overheating buildings, lightweight, overglazed and so on. You then do design the air engines to put through them, the ventilation engines through them, uh, enable that at different times of year, look at how you can harvest cool air and warm air at different times of year, the thermal landscaping of the building, its interaction with the outside air, and if you design a really good building with a low heartbeat, you can you don't need any extra energy really. If you design one that's a so-so building, you'll need some extra energy. And if you get a bad building, you'll need a huge amount of extra energy to just run it, to get it right. And this is the Oxford Eco House. You can see that it's got a very, very gentle heartbeat in all those in internal rooms. That's the basic budget. Am I time? Okay. A couple more minutes. Okay. Level two of a design is all the bits of equipment you put in it, right? Which is the, the heating or the cooling or the blinds or the shades or the shutters. But that's a secondary thing after the building. And if you get a bad building, uh, you can have the same so so building, but you can run it all on mechanical heating and cooling, and that's a bad solar building because you've just got to generate too much energy. And on the right, if you do a lot of that with passive uh, technologies and just a little mechanical heating and cooling it when you, when you need it. But the trouble is most of the HVAC engineers just deal in the, um, the me mechanical end, so they design these bad buildings. And all the architects are at the wow end of the le third level, which is how it looks and how it feels. So you've got architects up there in the wow end of level three. You've got HVAC engineers in the, in the mechanical end of level two. And nobody's at level one. Nobody's talking about that basic building. And you know what? Respect the radical technology movement, because we now have, 21 years later after this solar room, over a million solar roofs in Britain. And um, for the price of Hinkley C nuclear power station that's going to run power of six million homes, we could put in solar heating and um, storage tanks. We could put photovoltaics and batteries in six million homes and take a quarter of the homes out of, um, out of the poverty. <coughs> Where next? We're going into the age of batteries as well, and I've just put these batteries in and said, look, this is a 21-year-old, 4-kilowatt roof. That's a couple of days ago, and that's the first day in May. So you're still generating huge amounts of energy, and with the battery, you can do that. You can actually get it down to almost zero energy. If only I could persuade my lodger to wear brine nylon shirts. <laughs> shirt every morning we'd be on to a good thing so we built that with the help from cat um, 21 years ago and that was the first of what is now a million it's a movement that's unstoppable now and the last thought from uh, Robert Vale he says why is it that architects have turned into building hairdressers <laughs> Thank you.
Yes. I think it's appropriate. Can you hear me? I think it's appropriate because Sue's done you know, the good side. I'm, I'm now going to do the bad. Um, the um, uh, heating and, well, ventilation potentially, but um, um, introduce myself. I'm John Cantor. I've been involved with heat pumps for a long time. And it, it's, um, it's quite interesting because uh, uh, it's around about the mid 80s, I, I went to Sweden. Um, and over there, of course, they've embraced heat pumps quite well because they, they fit in well. They've got very low carbon electricity generation and uh, it fits there. Go to Denmark and it's like shock horror, you know, any environmentalist, heat pumps. <laughs> um, but I've, you know, always been, I hope, um, you know, if a heat pump isn't appropriate, it's a bad idea. Um, and, but I do, interestingly, Wade's house, um, who sort of introduced my background, um, I arrived at the <coughs> Centre for Alternative Technology in 1979 as a refrigeration engineer. Um, and at that time, when I went to CAT, there were a couple of heat pumps, two in Wade's house, because no one knew anything about them, you know, no one. Um, and by chance, that was my training. Um, and in fact, I came back two weeks later with my tools and my stuff and did some editing of the system there, which was uh, very poor. Wade's was brilliant, I think, in the building. Um, it was mentioned earlier, Pat mentioned it, uh, very interestingly, if you do all the maths and sums, it's, it's quite similar to now Passive House. In one thing it didn't have was a lot of solar gain, which is now the thinking in Passive House. Um, but they were working on very low energy and they um, decided that even though it's only a kilowatt, the Wade's House, they wanted uh, 300 watts in pump for the pump, which could have worked. Um, so, I'm completely lost now, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, got two minutes left. Two minutes left, okay. Um, some of the, just, uh, you know, at the time, uh, there is a chapter in medical technology about heat pumps, and it's quite interesting again, because when I read it, I don't know if you've read things like that, and it's sort of gobbledygook, really, because it's all talk, you know, when they explain how it works. Um, uh, but, by and large, it, it, it was you know, quite interesting, but it, it wasn't that relevant. And of course, the big arguments against heat pumps, um, this is how maybe it was, that if you're burning a fuel, um, at that time, maybe 28% comes down to that. Um, you, get, you, you drive now a heat pump, even a good heat pump at CFP3, which is possible, um, you're about the same as burning oil. Um, so it's not a bit of a gain. I've got another slide which is sort of a now uh, best case. Um, I've got a minute left, have I? Um, I mean, just to get a perspective about heat pumps, because of course, still people have got no idea how efficient, how the hell they work. And that's because they are a quite a complicated um, bit of technology. There's lots of, you know, inter, um, uh, interdependent parts. Um, but I've been working with installers recently, and now, of course, the good thing about the RHI is now we have to monitor data. Um, now, going back in the early days, you know, you were lucky to get. A, I mean, there were systems out there with a COP, a ratio of I'm not going to explain any of that mm. of three. Um, and at that time, the electricity generation was quite poor. Um, net benefit, including leaks of refrigerant, was very bad. Um, but actually now, this, the electricity generator is much cleaner, and we are down on this future line. This graph was made a while ago. We are somewhere down that way. Um, and we are seeing, I'm seeing, um, heat pumps working in houses, in simple systems. With my own house, actually, I'm recording the COP of 3.8. Um, and that's, um, I'm going to finish now, but the, it, because in a way, it'd be nice just to elaborate on that. Um, I'm working with Tristan here, who's doing some uh, energy monitoring, because it's crucial to know how they work. Um, so I think I've run out of time. Uh, I think I'll do. Yeah. <laughs> La City. Yes. So, this is the chapter, and um, this is it um, all spread out. <laughs> what happened was, um, 
we were in the beginnings of finding out where wind energy was going and just trying to get a grasp of all the different technologies, some of which have not come to any fruition, but we thought it's important to catalogue them because I've come across a lot of these things reinvented several times. And I just have to point them back to the chapter to show it's already been done. Um, one of the things which was animated was this one here, the um, bottom right, which is the job. Um, sorry, it's uh, James Blythe's um, Scotland windmill, which he built, wind generator, which is reckoned to be the world's first wind generator, 1891. Um, the one in the picture, they reckon, was running for about 20 years, bottom right. And the one above, which we should have included, is the Getsu wind turbine um, designed by Johannes Yule in 1957, which operated, I understand, about 50, 20 years. Um, that required the foothold for making reliable turbines in the future. Um, prior to this, we were at the Architectural Association. There was a group of us who were interested in the environment. We organized all kinds of lectures and started experimenting with uh, different kinds of wind turbines. The, the two on the top right of, uh, was a sail wing design, which I was experimenting in the 70s. And the one on the right is a, is a square profile uh, Darius type vertical axis turbine, which or performed so badly, I didn't think there was any point in putting a group of to at the time. And then below we have the Street Farmers Self, at, uh, which was at Comtech, and uh, John Shaw's experiments with integrating buildings with wind turbines. You're, you're difficult to hear over here. Oh, yes, oh sorry, yes, use the microphone. Sorry, yes, of course, please do. And there's a whole uh, range of experiments still going on with vertical axis in spite of that. This is uh, on the left we had uh, Jeff Watson building a, a, a Darius. Um, Will Grills built a, a variable pitch vertical axis turbine in uh, Exeter. And uh, Peter Musgrove built a variable geometry vertical axis H rotor. And uh, Brian Hurley was experimenting with uh, vertical axis. Brian's cell. here. I Where are you like to see that. Take a bow, Brian. Um, the other interesting thing which was happening not long after that, about 1978 or so, I think, this is the tin turbine which was rated to about a megawatt. It was a massive turbine built by the whole community of the school. Um, but then things started to come to a head really with the um, production of standardised blades. Um, mainly in Danish companies. It, it came about, I think, as a result of a number of competitions. But that provided the foothold for um, the technology to be developed so it was reliable. And then coinciding with the Americans trying to introduce um, uh, tax incentives, then the whole Danish wind industry managed to move in. And that really is the start of a proper technology which was working. These slides are not working very well on the screen. Um, this is really showing the current situation in, in the UK up at the top. There's um, 5,000 operational wind turbines on land and um, a thousand offshore and uh, the operational capacity is about 13, 39 um, <coughs> can't quite make it up. Yeah, sorry, but anyway, it's, it's rapidly growing. And the bottom one here is the growth of the global wind energy production. And we know, I think, of the order about 433 uh, gigawatts worldwide. This is just showing the whole families of different turbines which are now been experimented with or are operating. There's a whole range of horizontal axis turbines which are mainly differentiated by the number of blades. And um, vertical axis still have a range of configurations. There's the on the left is the Darius type, which is basically shaped like a form of a skipping rope, and that was the idea was to reduce the stresses. But it's a damn difficult thing to manufacture, install, and uh, maintain. And whilst a few of them were built, the one on the top left is a 4 megawatt built in Canada, which is still standing and operated quite no, successfully. It's not. 
Is that is that still there? Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Oh. It did well. Okay. And then up on the second from the right is the H rotor, which was tested at um, Carmarthen Bay. Peter Musgrove. I think it's about um, three or four hundred kilowatts. And it worked quite well, except the plates were not very well designed. So the first bad situation, they, they came up and they never built another one. And I thought there might be an interesting what change of approach, so I came up with this V configuration. Um, which is essentially a horizontal axis turbine turned on its side, so it's a lot simpler to manufacture, and has the possibility of having relatively short tower, but because of the triangular profile, you're getting up into the high wind speed zone. So this scope to uh, improve the uh, viability of vertical axis, and as far as I understand, it's the only aerodynamically lift-driven vertical axis turbine self-start. One of the big problems with lots of small vertical axis turbines is that they need to be electrically started. And there are quite a few examples where they've actually used more electricity over the year for starting <laughs> compared to generating. Anyway, so. We think this could be potentially be quite an interesting approach for offshore because you can have quite low level operations. Um, but whether vertical axes are actually going to work through because it's such a long uh, tradition of uh, horizontal axes now, we'll see. This was a, a development which was a single bladed version which we, Godfrey and, and I were experimenting with which had a balance weight and it was actually teetered this is the only vertical axis turbine which has a cantilever blade in existence. And uh, it took it up to 1,000 RPM and it just whispers. We did uh, try to develop it further, but we hit the times when the funding became unavailable. And so vertical axis is uh, really thought to be interesting. Um, so the main push in the industry is for bigger and bigger turbines. And these are the current um, once uh, on land, uh, this is uh, the one on the right is a two and a half, sorry, 7.5 megawatt turbine. The one in the middle would actually generate the same amount of electricity as the first Danish wind farm of 10 turbines, interestingly enough. So the push is to go bigger. Um, I'm not sure that's going to work, but we'll see. I think um, up until now we've had sort of steady evolution of the turbine technology. And uh, whereas this is now going into a much more uh, experimental regime, and also the, with the horizontal axis turbine, there's a, a gravitational limitation as the blades go around. That becomes a major problem with large blades. So that's going to drive us into carbon fiber and things. So the expense will go up. But we'll see. And this is a big project uh, for a 20 megawatt machine. Deep design project for the upgrade project. But I think there's potentially another interesting way to go, which is using multiple rotors. These have been around for a while, but um, we could then potentially scale up, particularly offshore. One of the big limitations of offshore is it, the tower is over-designed for the turbine. So you potentially could get much bigger turbines on the tower. Um, but obviously, if you can then just replicate with smaller numbers of turbines, you might be getting the benefit. And also there's a whole new development of uh, quad rotors and multiple rotor helicopters, so that understanding is becoming available. So I think that could be potentially an interesting way to go without the limitations of going very big. And this is the offshore resource. So this is the, the largest offshore wind farm. It is off the coast of Thanet. And I just this is the current um, Things of the production in the UK is on the right. Oh, sorry, on the left. And you can see it's, it's far the biggest of all the offshore projects. Um, if we are actually to get to the point where floating technology becomes viable, then we can use the deep water resource around Britain. And it's estimated that uh, if we're using fixed rotors and floating, that resource could be equivalent to the Gulf War reserves every year. I'm just going to talk about micro turbines, but uh, do you want to talk about micro turbines? Maybe, can you leave that up? Maybe, is that okay? Oh, sorry, oh, have you finished?
Well, it's just going to talk about micro turbines. Well, micro turbines really developed as a sort of battery charging system for boats and um, caravans and things. Um, and it was quite a successful little industry ticking along, and then all of a sudden people decided they wanted to put them on buildings, and the government started to try and encourage them. And so you had lots of interlopers coming into the micro turbine market. But uh, yeah, these are the six viable, on the whole, of the viable small turbines. Generally speaking, it doesn't make sense for a small turbine unless you're in a remote location. It's better to go for a bigger turbine and share the costs. But these are some of the possibilities. And there are a number of good countries out there, but there's an awful lot of misinformation on the internet, and you need to be pretty technically savvy to work out the ones. But this guy, Hugh Pickett, is probably been most successful in and expanding the whole small heat generator industry. Um, well, basically, there's several hundred people who've actually built his turbine, and they've actually set up an association, I think, called. And power wind or something. But anyway, community wind, um, we're going to talk about that later on, but this is probably makes more sense in most cases for to going up to a larger scale because you can generate excess electricity and make it an income. And this is potentially for, for housing is a good possibility because you can share the cost of the turbine between all the households. And the one on the right is the Hockerton housing project which was designed by Robert and Brenda Bell and they put together and got to, I think it's about 200 kilowatt to a bar. And this is probably the largest uh, offshore uh, wind cooperative as far as I know. This is the middle of London um, in Denmark which is 10 megawatt turbines. So it can be done offshore as well but this is a whole new story. This is some of the experimental stuff I've been doing with um, augmented wind turbines and using the shapes of the roofs. Uh, it turns out if you can increase the wind speed by a quarter, you can actually double the power out. And a lot of people managed to get augmentation to work in the wind tunnel. So these are the first ones to actually get a measured doubling of power out, but from the same turbine at the same height, hub height. We were actually using aerodynamic tricks to speed up the wind and suck wind in to the turbine. And we, we thought we were going to be constrained by having to have facing a particular wind direction, but it turns out it's actually bending the wind, so we can actually get to most of the option from just one orientation, which is very interesting. Um, these are some of the variations that we're kicking around, which could be in the open environment in certain situations even offshore. <laughs> the other interesting thing I probably would be worth mentioning is another innovation in, in towers is this timber tower which has been developed um, using um, cross laminated timber and they've actually had it operating and it seems to be performing pretty well and it, of course that also is uh, locking up carbon in the tower, which is one of the problems with turbines, of course, is with what do you do with them after they've done their job. So it's quite a lot of interest in trying to sort out ways. Um, Jim Platz, who was the guy behind the wooden tur wind turbine blade technology, is actually experimenting with bamboo, you know, which looks very promising. Okay, the other interesting technology, I'll brief, this is my last bit, is the um, solar chimney technology. Um, I was pretty skeptical about this because I did some analysis for Etsu looking at where the cooling towers could be applied, but it was pretty ropey. But a colleague of mine at the OU sort of sparked my interest in, and I thought um, potentially if we could actually um, also use wind augmentation, then it could be a pretty viable technology to produce both power and food, and also as a way of uh, making uh, fresh water. So. Uh, I think it's got potential. And you also, unlike lots of other technologies, you don't need water to raise steam through, and you can actually produce fresh water. And that's the current global mix of wind powers at the end of 2015. A massive difference. And I think at one time the wind power was exceeding coal in Britain this last year. Anyway, I'll give you that.
so thank you for the invitation. It came from uh, Jackie, and uh, we have been in contact with others for many years. And also, I'm sorry not to bring any visuals here. This is what I do tonight when I make another presentation. Um, I, um, it was um, very interesting there 40 years ago to, 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 to know the radical uh, technology book, uh, book there, and was a great inspiration. By that time, by that time we had no concern about climate. For that reason, it was not urgent to push renewable energy. In my country, it was important to push it because we had the energy crisis in 1974, and people were sitting in their homes and they were freezing, and that was a, like a strong appeal to the population. Something had to be done. Some that, well. Some of this, what we did there, uh, makes sense still today and was the basis of the situation we are in today, not only in Denmark, but worldwide. I dare say, I dare say, if the wind power development did not start in Denmark to, by that time, maybe there'd be no wind power in the world today, maybe. Because there were some people to develop it and there were some people to buy it. We have other technologies which were never developed. The wind power, you cannot go out and buy, buy any wind power plant. You cannot go and buy any sterling engine equipment. There are several kinds of equipment which was never developed. Mm -hmm. So what we saw was a combination, and I'm happy you showed that, of the gas and windmill from the 1950s, but which of course could not be applied to present or contemporary technology. It was antiquated and could never be accepted. But that was combined with the blades of the trade windmill which were lucky to go to Stuttgart University to get the blades and fit to the to the new concept. And that became the Danish concept. And that was the beginning of the of the wind power in Denmark and and from there then spreads to the world. And today it's a very promising technology, very promising and certainly going to be the main driver of energy uh, production in the future. I'm frankly convinced of that, together with the solar. Uh, but there was a big number of, of, um, of technologies mentioned in the book by that time. There was a biomass, there was a hydropower, there was a wave energy, there was a different kinds of solar technology. There was also, uh, but what not much said much about was the, we call it rational use of energy. This was combined heat and power. And what was more obvious to use? We have these power stations with efficiency to, from 30 to 40 percent, where we let more than half of the energy escape out of the uh, out of the cooling towers. Huh. So the first we did in Denmark was to to take this to take this energy. This is also energy. Not only electricity is energy. Hot water is also energy because this we can use for heating our houses. So this was the first we did in Denmark in 1980 and, 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 and the, in the following years, so that 65% soon of all electricity and also all heating came from combined heat and power. And this is the lowest hanging of all the fruits. This is the lowest hanging of all the fruits. For instance, if we go to Germany, they could heat up all the houses of the gas they import from Putin. They don't do. We think this is so, such a difficult infrastructure to put some black pipes, a loop for warm water in the streets. I think this is a technology which is so hard. They can build railways, they can build motorways, they can have all other kinds of pipes in the ground. But this is heating and combined heating power not. Okay. Uh, well, but we also see that also we have in principle, no technological constraints to make the transition now to a total fossil-free future. There are no such constraints. There are only political constraints, and they're very strong. Can I think about that in the same time that we wrote a book, we wrote something similar in Denmark. There were sitting people in, in Silicon Valley and, 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 and inventing the, the information technology. This has all penetrated our societies. Even our children are going around with these telephones in their pockets. And, 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 but, but, but in terms of renewable energy, the barriers are huge. They're really huge. 
They're so huge that let's for instance take wind power. This wind power is pushed out in the ocean because it's such a terrible view to see the wind power. So terrible. Some of the worst we can even imagine. It's worse than seeing presents, it's worse than seeing, than seeing slaughteries or oil refineries or power stations or power lines or industrial farms. All the, on motorways, that would be in terms of noise and killing birds and so on, the worst of all that we have. But this we still keep on land. This we can accept. But the wind power we cannot accept. And then we choose a very expensive way of doing it, growing ocean. We saw the figures here. And, 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 and this, is, this is of course in the interest of the big power companies. This is just to leave the future to them. Because if we were going to decentralize our energy systems, which would be natural, because the potential of renewable energy is that you can have it on every building, you can have solar of different kinds, Everywhere you have wind, you can make wind. Everywhere you have biomass and farms and so on, forests, you know. But that leads to, in principle, decentral systems. Whereas the conventional energy forms, the, the coal, gas, and most of all, the nuclear power leads to centralized. You can also not make small oil families. But, but because technology works for, development works for Decentral, and the big power companies, they know that. They have no future, and they know that. They work very hard at the political level by lobbying and so on. The Danish Dom Company had a, had a lobby group of 20 people sitting in Boston, in Massachusetts, for one year to convince the politicians that, that, um, that uh, offshore wind power was the best for for the Americans as well also, which is not of course. Because there's an, also an economical dimension in this here. There's also an economical dimension. I'm sure that if nuclear power in Britain was not compared to offshore, there would be no discussion about the, 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 the Hinkley Point C. So I dare say that offshore is also paying the way for nuclear power because renewable energy also has to be cheap. It must be cheap. Otherwise, it will not be accepted by industry and it has no real long-term uh, perspective, to my point. Reverend, you are coming to the end of your time. You're yeah, time is running, of course. I'm speaking fast, but still time is running. <laughs> I'm so, well, but also, uh, I, 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 I have this interest to say a few things about the atomic energy there. But also the, 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 the solar energy is the second, is the second promise of the future. The, well, we have the thermal solar, and uh, thermal solar is now also mature and it's very cheap. And the, the cheapest storage of all we have are huge, huge ponds in the grounds, hundreds of thousands of cubic meters, where you can store the hot water from the summer and also uh, keep it for till next spring. And these huge water ponds also is, uh, are good to take the excess power from the wind. There's also a worry what to do about this excess power. But just imagine we, we need three times more energy for heating our houses than we need for the classical needs for electricity. So all uses of energy for heating that we can do by renewables is also important for the future. And these technologies are there also. And the same we could say about the solar energy also. What to do about the solar energy uh, in terms of electricity? The, 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 the chemical storages, they are, and battery storage and so on, are and will certainly in the future also be expensive. And are mostly for the, for the, for the transport, for mobility. But there will also be plenty of excess power from that side. And we have to find cheap storage solutions for this as well. So, well, I... Um, um, uh, Perhaps we can I, the rest of your ideas yeah, I have, um, Well, I, I, I should just mention about the, the cost of, of these here. Because uh, actually today, on land, on land, 
We see that in, 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 in Brazil, we see that in Mexico, we see that also in Denmark, we see that in China, we see that in Morocco and in Egypt, that the real costs of wind energy is now close to, let's say, between two and three pence per kilowatt hour. Between two and three pence per kilowatt hour. The atomic energy we are talking about from Hinkley Point is four or five times more. It's between two and three pence. But we leave this sector also for the speculators. We leave it for the speculators, and this, that brings prices much too high up. There is no, and was also by that time, no discussion how we make it for the common good. And because we make it for the speculators, it, it, it comes also, also when we use the feed in tariff. Let's say we have the wind turbines here, and we have the power lines going, going here. As, as long as the wind turbines is for speculation, and the, we have examples in Denmark where the cost of the land for a wind turbine can be more than the cost of the wind turbine because there's a capitalization. Whereas the power line is a regulated area where society decided what is the compensation to the landowner when the power line is installed. And that, see, that shows that we are far away still from being serious on developing policies for the renewables. We're far from that. And I mean, this is a real effort we have to focus at that. But also, again, also comparing what we did um, there for 40 years ago and what we are today uh, is, of course, something we have to consider still. And when, um, when um, um, I'm sure that when the COP22 happens in uh, Marrakesh here later this year, we will come to some turning point also, because we see countries like Egypt, uh, Morocco and so on, are now getting an interest in renewable energy, and they will demonstrate these extremely low prices I mentioned here before. Can we stop at that point, please? That's yeah. really yeah. good, yeah. because we so have one more This speaker. is what we would never... Yeah. I introduce myself. My name is Jaap Hoog. Uh, that's the logo of my uh, company, Hinkwind. It's a windrose. We can see distribution of the wind from different sides. Um, next please. I uh, have a professional uh, career in electrical engineering, energy conservation, renewables since 1973, and wind since at the Kleine Aarde, which is something that is in the book Radical Technology, that's the interview with C. Sleeman. And I inhabited the first autonomous house in the Netherlands, which is in, in a uh, cutaway ship here. Um, what's not on is, is the solar collector that used to be here for heat storage underneath, uh, a wind turbine somewhere there. And, um, oh, okay. um, water storage tank, water recycling, um, what else did we have? Oh yeah, biodigester, that was also somewhere behind it. Uh, I lived in it for two years, the, the idea was to be self-sufficient in energy, that didn't work out quite. The insulation of the house was as calculated and expected and measured. The heating, the seasonal heating, didn't work at all because uh, insulation should have been much, 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 much more. I did some calculations on it, but they were obviously wrong. <laughs> and, and it was all built with, you know, scrap materials. But it was a very nice experiment and there were about 30,000 people every year that came to the house to learn about <coughs> change our energy ways. We have to conserve energy, that's the first thing. And then we have to use renewables and if it's not possible to do that, then you can finally maybe use some fossil fuels. We call that the Trias Energetica. Um, next please. So. The first time I met uh, Godfrey 
Boyle and Peter Harper was when I went to a tour of alternatives in the UK and I went to Lower Shore Farm. There's probably, maybe some people were there also, I don't know. You were there. Is that you, Godfrey? I don't uh, know, that isn't me. No, that's not me. That's just not in this one. Thanks, please. This is that was me. <laughs> <laughs> When we were still beautiful and young. Young <laughs> anyway. <laughs> he is editing. Next one, please. Um, so, I've been working in uh, energy consultancy, um, information dissemination on subject of renewable energy and energy conservation. I work with the government, the Netherlands government, the, say, the, the, the deck of the Netherlands to manage R&D programs in the development of the technology of wind turbines onshore and offshore, offshore since 1996. Uh, after that I started my own company to um, consult them how to apply for subsidies to develop wind technology, which I'm still doing. <coughs> One of the things I did last year was uh, working with a company that uh, has made um, a motion compensation uh, bridge, which is on a ship. This is a ship that would move, and here is the compensation me mechanism with a bridge with which you can go onto a wind turbine offshore, which is supposed to help to uh, make maintenance installation cheaper and bring the ties the, the price of offshore of wind energy down. Actually, uh, Dom Energy has bid into a 350, 700 megawatt offshore wind farm uh, last month, and they bid at a price of 7.7 .7 euro cents per kilowatt hour, which is very, very, very low. Which is, I must say, without the electricity connection from shore. But that costs about one and a half cents. So then that's the direction offshore wind is going. So we're getting even cheaper than wind on land in our country. Um, you've actually got to the end of your... Have <coughs> 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 I? Oh, she said you said you There's only two slides. Okay, can okay. I have a few more minutes? I'm just... This is, this is, this is uh, <laughs> the, the latest things I've been working on, which is offshore airborne wind energy. It's a company in our uh, country called Ampix that designs these small, uh, it's kind of a glider which can be steered, self-sufficiently steered by a computer within and which turns in eights and pulls up the cable and on the cable is a winch and generator that generates electricity. Mm -hmm. They have prototypes of uh, 50 kilo nowadays building up to 402 megawatts in the next few years and now they're uh, <coughs> trying to investigate how they could make that in an offshore wind farm. Which is of course another 15 years away before you can do that. Next please. So, other things I'm into is zero energy housing. I was already talking about that there's a, um, an organization in the Netherlands called Agenda who is actually actively propose, proposing that and uh, working on that and they were also the company that sued the Dutch state for neglect of the climate, climate on behalf of the citizens and they won. Mm. So now the government has to do something, although they first will object to the uh, field. Yeah. Oh, well. And that's me in uh, a trip to the north North Hoyle offshore wind farm. Mm. Not too far from here, I think. But that's it. Great. And it's all due to radical technology. <laughs> well, I'm the timekeeper, and we've overrun by a quarter of an hour, which is quite good for a day like this with so much um, information in the day. So um, the supper will be in about half an hour's time. So it's up to you. Would you like to have a few questions or shall we end at this point? Peter, 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 what are you going to say if he was at the very end? Uh, yeah, yeah, but do we need a couple of questions? Do we have any questions? Has anybody got to take two questions? Sure, yeah. Okay.
this. Yeah. It's, it's a comment and a question. Uh, I'd like to absolve radical technology for not doing much with solar PV. At the time, solar PV generated electricity at 100 times the oh, cost yes. of yeah, yeah. energy, yeah. right? And, but in 1975, the world's greatest electrochemist, John Omara Bokris, wrote a book, Energy, the Solar Hydrogen Alternative, and the uh, clues are all in there. Uh, I started, and my name's David Saunders, I started a solar power co-op in Bristol five years ago. At the time that the wholesale cost of solar energy was £2,000 a kilowatt, and that meant that a kilowatt of solar energy would generate £3,000 worth of electricity over a 25-year life. There wasn't any point in doing solar before then. Uh, now, just a little news update. In Chile, the government put solar energy out to tender. They get a little bit more sunlight than we do here. Not a lot much. Not much more. No subsidies, no nothing. How cheap would you sell electricity <coughs> to the government if we just bought it off you? And the lowest tender was 2.2 pence a unit. Mm. We buy electricity in this country at 15 or 16 pence a unit. We buy gas at 4 pence a unit. We buy the average energy bill in the UK is two thirds gas. So you can imagine how much of our emissions come from the methane that we burn. But if you could buy electricity for half the price of methane, generate hydrogen from it, power your hydrogen fuel cell buses cheaper than methane, then you get the solar hydrogen economy that was predicted the same time this book came out. So uh, no, as far as what we had today, I, I am completely at sea. I, I thought it would be neat at the end of the day that we would have some lovely uh, conclusions. I, I don't think there are too many conclusions. Uh, um, it's interesting because radical technology uh, gathered together uh, all sorts of strands. I mean, people have said it very often that it's a right old rag bag, isn't it? You know, all sorts of different things. At different levels and things like that. But then you have so much to cover, you might as well sort of sample in lots of different ways. Anyway, then we gathered it all together, we produced it, it set many hairs running, uh, as we say in English. Yes. Um, okay, <coughs> everywhere, all sorts of places, and, and a lot of people in this room picked up these hairs and, and went on and, and did all sorts of other things. Um, uh, and that, what we heard, there are lots of these. these, these trajectories have been traced, and some of them have done very well. Some of them have you know, become mainstream and, and gone off and done good things. Uh, some just stayed there in the book. <laughs> they were went anywhere. Uh, others um, have sort of, we think, ah, hang on a minute, is that just about to take off? So for example, the hydrogen economy, since Bokris's book, has been the great white hope well, ever since then. We've all said, oh, it's, the great, oh, hydrogen economy, it's only five years away. <laughs> five years later, it's only five years away, it's only five years away. So um, we've been waiting for the great hydrogen revolution for a long time, but finally, I don't know. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's not efficient. No, well, okay. Uh, okay, but because we're, we have been expecting uh, the River Simple and, and Hugo uh, Spowers to arrive with his hydrogen car. Um, no, he hasn't come yet. Okay. Well, there, there are some health and safety Another problems. Another five years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we wait for five years and then <laughs> five years come back. So, um, it's possible if he does arrive, then anybody who wants to ride in the hydrogen car can get one. But anyway, th there's an example. So I was wondering, I don't know, this is an idea I've had. Um, We've got these huge long sheets of paper. I could put them in the sort of main room where we're having um, the, the events this evening. And we, I don't know whether we, it's worth sort of filling up these things and looking at some of these, <coughs> we've got near these patterns. The technologies that, the, the hairs that got, you know, that went and got big um, and, and went to things. And then the question of whether they sort of went sour. As we were getting that, that idea this morning that Tony was talking about, that. The, the, the good development and then the dystopian development is happening. So very often you get this ambivalent sense that, yeah, it's really going, that's great, it's really good, but hang on a minute, there's a bad side to it too, mm. just sort of cancelling it out. 
Now, the bad side we normally associate with um, commercial forces, market capitalism. I mean, we, we big commercial companies grab hold of it and they lose interest in the public good in that sense because they, they just need to make money out of it. So they'll tweak it and deform it in any way that they can in order to make money. And our problem as, as radical technologists is to look at that and say, no, that's not the way to do it. You need to, uh, you need to grab control of it. We need to, it needs to be under, it needs to be developed for the general good. How do you do that? I mean, that's, that's, that's politics. Okay, so we're supposed to tell the politicians, this is, you have to set the regulations and you have to organize things so that it can't go wrong. But it constantly goes wrong. We constantly leave ourselves out of the picture. We, we do a lot of community scale stuff for quite a few years and then we all get fed up with it. We get bored, we burn out, no problem. We get fed up with it and then eventually some uh, clever um, commercial developer gets hold of it and then we say, oh, all right, off we go. And, and then you get ordinary capitalist forces operating and then the costs come down and we all say, oh, it's all right. I mean, look what's happened to computers and stuff like that. We all, and Moore's law. I mean, it's incredible. And we all sort of say, okay, well, Moore's law, fair enough. We all take advantage of it. Um, Can so, I time keep you as well? Yes, because you, I think you may. So on a the, bit. Question I'm <laughs> <laughs> the question I'm asking is, uh, can we make such lists of these things? Can we sort of say, here are the technologies that were complete lemons that deservedly stayed in the book. Here are the ones that should have got developed that didn't because nobody took a particular interest, nobody took a surprise of it. Here are the ones that took off, became very big. Um, and here are the ones that went sour and we need to think about that and get a bit more radical and a bit more political about that. And I don't know, there are other lists. I mean, there could be... The ones that are about to take off. Mm -hmm. the, the ones that are about to take off. I mean, like hydrogen. Yeah. <laughs> no? Oh, okay, well, that, that's good. You see, you, hot yeah. tips. I mean, let's, let's have... Let and buy. even the famous, terrorist, the famous terrorist Tiger. that yeah. you actually Tiger. said, Tiger. we've shown well, you 40 it's years that that isn't working. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing that's about sure. to take off. Communities yeah. in cities, you see. Yeah. Might take another 20 years, but... 40 years is very small in the history of mankind. Yeah, but we've only got about another 20 before yeah. the shit hits the fan. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay.